Welcome to the SJSU School of Information Career Colloquia session on Real Jobs, Remote Work. My name is Jane Fisher and I am the Manager of Career Initiatives and Resources. Thank you for joining us tonight. We were going to have four presenters with us tonight to share their experience on what it is like to work virtually and how to land a job in a virtual environment. But unfortunately, our first speaker, Tom Adamech, was called away on a family emergency. Luckily, Deanne Fix is able to step in and cover Tom's presentation as well as her own. Our presenters are all iSchool alumni who worked virtually first as interns and then transitioned to regular employment. So let's get started. Deanne, I'm handing it off to you. My name's Deanne, uh, and I am a San Jose State graduate. I graduated uh, in May of 2014, so not too long ago. And I survived the e-port, um, so it is, it is possible. <laughs> um, I am currently the manager of library and information services at Sandberg, Phoenix, and Von Gontard, which is a law firm in St. Louis. And I also work for MightyNet Library Services as an independent cataloging contractor. So, um, and I kind of, I started as an intern there and uh, now I work for them uh, as a contracted employee. So I'm going to just talk a little bit first about um, virtual internships and jobs in general. Um, you know, some of the good things, bad things, um, and how to, how to land one. And then I'm also going to be giving Tom's presentation. He was going to go more into the, um, what the Mighty Net uh, internship program looks like. So I am more than happy to present that also for him. Okay, some of the reasons uh, to consider a virtual internship. Uh, the, one of the best things is that you can really work from anywhere. Um, I am from St. Louis. I live here now and uh, attended, you know, San Jose State Online like all of you do. Um, when I was looking for internships, though, I noticed that a lot of them, especially the in-person internships, were all based in California. And since moving to California, as much as I would love to do that, uh, wasn't really an option. I started looking into more uh, virtual opportunities. Um, also, the, a good thing was that it uh, provides flexible hours for the most part, um, especially with MightyNet. I was able to kind of work whenever. While I was in school, I was working as a bartender, so a lot of times I'd come home at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning and get some work done, so that's really nice to have some flexible hours if that's, um, you know, something that's important to you. Um, it also shows future, employer, future employers that you're really motivated and that you can work with limited supervision, which is, I, I think is something that's uh, a, a great skill to have. You know, em employers that hire you, um, you know, they don't want to be looking over your shoulder constantly, nor do you want them to do that. So, you know, being able to complete successfully um, an internship virtually, um, you know, really shows that, that you can work within time. Uh, time frames. And also, um, you know, it teaches you time management skills as, you know, going to school and doing classes online also does. Um, the other nice thing is that it allows you to work with people from all over the country. Uh, Tom, one of my bosses, he is in North Carolina. MightyNet is actually, um, for, it's in Wisconsin, the, the main building, and all of us uh, contracted employers, employees are kind of all over the country. So, you know, it really gives us a chance to kind of um, work with people that you wouldn't normally work with. Um, and I, I haven't been able to attend um, any of them yet, but they have meetups at the ALA annual and the midwinter. So it's nice to put, you know, face to everybody that you are in contact with strictly through email. Uh, it's also nice uh, to you know, you may be able to use some virtual communication tools that you may not be familiar with, so it gives you a chance to learn some some new technology, which is always helpful, uh, especially if, you know, you're going to work at maybe a corporate law, uh, corporate library or a law library or something like that that has multiple offices. You know, they may look for someone who has used, you know, their technology to cut down on training time. And it also gives you the idea of what a virtual career, you know, would really entail if that's something that you decide to pursue after your virtual internship. Instead of taking a virtual job, you know, and not having any kind of experience before that. So it really gives you a chance to get your feet wet. Okay. Now, of course, there's always downsides to everything. Um, so I wanted to put those in, too. So one of the downsides is that the competition uh, is can sometimes be pretty fierce for virtual internships, obviously due to the lack of geographical boundaries, meaning, you know, everyone 
who has access to a computer can really perform that internship, so there's going to be a lot more competition. Uh, as you all know also, you know, virtual does not mean easier. I'm sure we've all had uh, classes um, that, you know, are, are very difficult regardless of whether or not they're online or in person. And sometimes, you know, having things virtual can be more difficult. Um, you also don't get the opportunity to network in person for the most part. Uh, most of your communication is, you know, either over the phone or by email. There's no face-to-face. -face, there's no, you know, office kind of dynamic, um, no happy hours or lunches or anything like that. So, you know, if you're someone that really thrives on that kind of environment, then perhaps maybe a virtual job isn't necessarily the best, the best path for you. Um, the other you know, kind of downside, especially when you're starting out, is you don't get the face-to-face. -face. So if you have a question about something, you can't just, you know, call some call someone, you know, in the next office and ask them to come over and help you. Um, you really have to rely on, you know, kind of problem solving for yourself and uh, hoping that the person that you're uh, trying to contact is quick with uh, email answering and everything, as I'm sure you've all um, you know, maybe you had to deal with as far as teachers and classes and things like that. So, you know, that's one of the downsides as well. Um, the, the other problem that I've noticed is, um, you know, email and virtual communication, it really has its own kind of rules and etiquette. Um, tone can often become misconstrued during uh, emails and texting. Um, you know, so you really kind of have to watch that and also, you know, at the, in the same regard, maybe not take take everything too personally. If, if, you know, an email seems kind of short, well, maybe it's because that person's on their cell phone and they're, you know, just trying to type a quick email. It's not always, um, you know, that you're doing something wrong or that they're mad or something. So, you know, that's also something to consider. Um, and then I also put a link down here to um, San Jose State's you know, kind of link to their virtual internship pages. There's tons of great information on there. Um, Dr. Frank's uh, contact information is on there. She is the uh, moderator, coordinator of the uh, virtual internship program, and she's wonderful. So highly recommend checking out that page if, if you're really interested in pursuing a virtual internship or job. Okay, some great places to look for virtual internships or jobs. Um, the best place is probably the San Jose State uh, iSchool Internship Database. There is an area on there um, where you can strictly look for virtual jobs. And I know I was just on there a couple days ago, and I've noticed that they have added a lot since I was looking for an internship. So it seems like, you know, that's becoming more and more um, uh, common to have virtual internships, so I highly recommend looking there. Um, another great place is inalj.com or I-N-A-L-J, however you want to say that, uh, .com. Um, they have a link for virtual jobs. They also have jobs in other states, um, so it's just a really great resource. It's all run by librarians. Um, and people in library schools. It's all volunteer. I actually am um, going to put in my plug here because I'm a, an assistant uh, editor there. Um, it's a great, great opportunity to volunteer and, um, you know, kind of get, get your name out there in the library community. And another great place to check is um, maybe look at some other library schools' career pages. Um, you know, look at their job or their uh, internship opportunities. They may have things on there that, that San Jose State doesn't you know, and maybe just contact them directly. Um, and that's another way to go uh, to find internships. Okay, how to secure your virtual internship. So once you've identified one internship, you know, maybe you're interested in one or two that you're looking at, definitely start looking early. Um, uh, some of them are going to have different class requirements that you need to have before, and not just San Jose State's requirements, but some of the internships will say, you know, maybe you need cataloging as MightyNet um, does, or maybe, you know, you need some kind of tech background or tech classes or something. So really, you know, start looking early and, and try to plan out and see um, what you want to, you know, maybe start pursuing. And, you know, the earlier you find something, the better. 
Um, it's also great to apply early. Contact the internship coordinator, maybe a semester before. Just let them know, you know, say, hey, I'm, I'm looking at this internship. Is there any more information you can kind of give me on it? These are the classes that I've taken or, you know, this is the direction that I kind of want to move in my career. Um, does it seem like a good fit? And just get your name out there to the, um, to the coordinators and they're going to remember you. Um, also, some of them may require reference letters, so make sure to give uh, the people that you've contacted or that you asked to write reference letters, make sure you give them enough time. You know, nobody wants to rush and, and write a reference letter for you in a day or two. And also, definitely make note of the deadlines and stick to them. Um, you know, if you turn your application in a day or two late, they may not even open it and look at it, and then you may have missed out on a great opportunity. So, you know, make sure that you definitely know when the deadline is to apply and get all that in early. And my virtual internship experience, as I said before, um, I did my internship with MightyNet Library Services in the fall of 2013. And I was one of four interns, but I was the only one from San Jose State. So I got to interact with um, with other library students from other universities, which was nice. Uh, we had a we had a short orientation process, and we went through training. And uh, the internship itself, um, we did a lot of cataloging, uh, and that's what my Nina does. And I'll get more into you know what exactly the internship was later, um, but. As far as the experience for me, it was it was difficult at first, you know, to learn a whole new system, obviously. But the um, like it says on here, we had uh, bi-monthly conference calls with Tom, and so he was the internship uh, advisor, and he was really helpful. And um, you know, we could call him at any time with questions. Um, you know, and we just kind of check in and see how everything was going and he, you know, give us updates on our progress and say, you know, I've noticed in these records maybe you're doing this wrong and, you know, let's tweak a little bit. So he was really great with that. Um, we also had to do a weekly blog about our experience and that was for San Jose State. And at the end for MightyNet we did a position paper. And mine focused on cataloging as an essential job function, so I really looked at um, a lot of different library job descriptions and looked at the skills that they were uh, asking for. And I noticed that a lot of them had some type of cataloging, you know, either preference or you had to have some kind of experience in cataloging. So, you know, that really kind of um, solidified my, uh, you know, knowledge that cataloging is still around, it is still um, relevant, and it's not just for technical librarians. Okay, so some takeaways from my virtual experience, or my virtual internship. Uh, I really got great experience doing both copy and original cataloging, and that was, that's really um, important, I feel like. Um, I had, a, I get a lot of experience creating metadata, um, assigning LC classifications, Library of Congress subject headings, SEERS, um, you know, so just getting to know a lot of the different classification systems and subject headings and, you know, how to, how to assign those, how to, um, you know, look at the tables, uh, the LC classification tables and, and figure out, you know, how they build those, those numbers. Um, I also learned a lot of professional communication skills, as I mentioned before, with, you know, tone and email and things like that. Um, it really gave me a chance to hone my professional email skills, um, which are, you know, quite different than if you're just emailing your friend. You're going to, you know, try to tidy up your emails a bit more if you're, if it's uh, in a professional setting. Um, I really acquired a lot of time management skills, um, as I did throughout my entire career at San Jose State, but definitely with MightyNet, um, we had a very, we have a very strict deadline there. Um, once you get records, um, you know, you have a week to finish them. And, you know, you could start them all the night before if you wanted to, or, you know, as most people do, they kind of, you know, spread it out so you're not doing a lot of work all at the end. Um, and since I finished my internship, they hired me on as an independent contracting con catalog, sorry, independent contracted cataloger. <laughs> it's very hard to say sometimes. Um, so I, I've been working with them since then, and uh, I really use a lot of the skills that I learned during my internship in my full-time job uh, as a law librarian. 
So it was a really great experience and I highly, highly recommend it to everyone. And here is my contact information. Um, I, there's my LinkedIn profile on there and my email. Feel free to contact me, ask me anything you want about you know, the uh, internship process in itself, even the application, anything like that. Um, I'm more than happy to, to, uh, to talk to you about that. Okay, so I am going to also present Tom's portion, so I hope I haven't bored you all too much yet. Um, I'm going to go through this a little quicker um, than I did the last one, just because, you know, this isn't my presentation, so uh, bear with me, um, and I will try to get through this. Okay, so Tom is the content and systems librarian at MightyNet, and he is also the internship program manager. Uh, so he does the hiring and, uh, you know, goes through the application process. And he did tell me before, um, before I started tonight that he wanted to really stress that uh, MightyNet has a really great uh, relationship with San Jose State. San Jose State was actually the first university that they contacted about um, having interns. And so a lot of the ICCs that I work with now are San Jose State graduates. Um, he said they are, summer's full, but they are looking for three interns for the fall and three for the spring. So he wanted me to stress to, um, you know, if you're interested to please submit applications. They love having San Jose State students. Okay. So an increased demand for quality metadata has created a shortage of knowledge man management professionals. Um, really in our field, so what MightyNet does, um, we get books, mostly children's books, from a publisher, and then we create the, uh, the metadata and the catalog um, record, the MARC record that you see in a library catalog. So if a library decides to purchase that book from the publisher, they can, you know, say to the library, well, we already have all the cataloging done. So then the library doesn't have to have one of their technical services librarians or, you know, if they don't even have one, maybe just another librarian or even a staff member uh, to input all that. So that's really what MightyNet does. And, um, you know, Tom, I know, has, has mentioned that he's really noticed a shortage, especially in the library field, of people that know how to catalog and create quality metadata. And the role center is where we work out of in MightyNet. Um, it is a web-based user interface, and we get PDF versions of the book, so before they're published. And from that book, you know, that's where we get all of our information to catalog. So some of them come with Library of Congress classifications already, so we can do some copy cataloging. Some have absolutely no cataloging done whatsoever and then we really have to start from scratch. So it really just kind of depends on the publisher um, and what, you know, what stage in the publishing process we get those books. And this is kind of what it looks like here. This is the home page and the login screen. So this is what we see when we go in and then this is also what our customers see. From here, this is the attribute screen. So when we get a record, this is the information that we're going to have. Um, this isn't always all filled in. Most of the time it doesn't look like this. Um, you know, this is, pretty, this is pretty filled in, so this would be kind of a good record to get because uh, there's not too much left to fill in after that. And then what this does from here is it puts it into an edit screen where we can then add in um, the rest of the information that's needed and we can change the field numbers and things like that. Okay, this is kind of what I went over earlier, just kind of pros and cons and um, as virtual internships, what makes a good um, virtual employee, um, really need to be flexible. Um, really with, with, especially with technology and software, you really need to be adaptable with that. Um, I know since I've started at MightyNet, this is our second interface and it changes quite a bit. Um, the cataloging rules change quite a bit. We get constant updates from, um, from our bosses and, um, you know, that, that things have changed. So it's really, you really have to stay on top of technology and, uh, and new trends. Uh, also, as I said, you know, you 
if working from home, you know, you may not be working nine to five. Um, you know, you may be doing a lot of work on on the weekends, especially with Mighty Nut. Um, it's just kind of whenever you have time. So, you know, I work a full time job, and then sometimes I come home from work and do some cataloging, or you know, maybe on Sundays I'll do cataloging. So it really just kind of depends on uh, on what works best for your schedule. Um, yeah. Move on to the next slide here. Okay. You also need to be motivated, as I said before. Um, you know, you don't have a manager constantly looking over your shoulder, telling you, you know, this needs to get done, this, this, and this. Um, you really have to set those goals for yourself. And uh, as far as Mighty Note goes, um, you know, if you have a really slow week, you could say, okay, well, I only want to do, you know, four records this week. Or, you know, if you know you have a ton of free time, you could say, I can get ten done this week. So it's really just about knowing your own limits, what you can handle, and, uh, you know, and not pushing yourself too, too much to get, um, to get work done. Mm -hmm. Again, you also have to be organized, as I said before, um, you know, the cataloging rules change quite a bit, um, especially from publisher to publisher, so it really kind of depends on, you know, what, what books you're cataloging that day. So you really need to be detail-oriented, um, as I'm sure anyone who's taken cataloging can attest to that. Um, and you also need to be able to, you know, take the corrections, um, you know, really take note of what corrections you're getting on a consistent basis and, and be able to make those uh, corrections and reduce your errors. So, um, you know, when you, when you put the records into the, the QC, the quality control process, they, um, you know, they're not having to go through and correct every little mistake that you've made. So the program itself, they have about four to six interns per semester. Um, and the interns work the same as the ICCs do. Um, they, they assign the real items from the publishers. Um, they use the same software and the company specific guidelines. So the internship program, I mean, you're really kind of working as already as an ICC, which is nice. And they, they're on teams with other ICCs, you know, so they can help them out as well. Um, again, same as I said before, they're submitted records, they're reviewed, um, the interns are given feedback on their records, and uh, they completed a position paper on their experience or on a topic of their choosing regarding cataloging or metadata. Uh, in order to apply for Mighty Nuts, uh internship program, you submit a letter of interest, um, your resume, there's a profile survey questionnaire, and then there's also a statement of proficiency saying that you've completed uh, cataloging, which I believe it's still 248. Um, so you just get a letter of proficiency from your professor and, uh, you know, just submit all of that. And definitely with Mighty Net, the earlier the better. I know they get a ton of applications. Um, but like I said before, they love San Jose State students, so they always give priority to, um, to us. And these are just some of the participating schools that they've had. Um, like I said before, San Jose State is the first one that, that they've partnered with, so they really like us. And just here are some of the highlights um, from the ICC program. So as you can see in 2012, they started with three interns. That was the first year. Um, 2013 was the year that I completed mine. Um, there was four of us, and um, of the four of us, I believe Three, possibly four, um, are still working for MightyNet as, as an ICC. So it's really kind of a pipeline right into the ICC program, um, which is great. And so Tom just wanted me to talk a little bit about the future of virtual career, careers. Um, he said that you really need some, uh, the corporate culture and support to be successful. So meaning, um, you know, as far as the virtual career goes, you really need to feel like you're part of a team. And I think Mighty Nets does a really great job with that. Um, you know, we have email chains and we Skype and, you know, we try to make everybody feel like we're all working together as a team. Um, uh, employers also see benefits of, of virtual work. Um, you know, their employees can have a nice work-life balance with fl flexible schedules, um, flexible, uh, geography, <laughs> if you will, um, and really the technology is what makes the virtual career work. Um, 
you know, if you don't, if you're not technically savvy, it's probably not going to work for you. Um, let's see. Oh, he's got a report down here, um, a link to really what virtual careers and what virtual work is kind of moving towards. So maybe check that out. And there is Tom's um, contact information. Again, as Jane said, I know he's more than willing to answer any questions. He's, uh, he's, he's really personable. He loves questions. He loves talking to students. So definitely reach out to him if you have any questions about MightyNet or, um, you know, maybe what they're looking for um, in an intern or anything like that. Um, he's more than happy to answer those questions for you. And that's it. That's it for me. Thank you. Um, this is Laura from Sandera, and I am the Instructional Technology Specialist uh, with Credo Reference. And I am also a mother of two boys, so that's one of the things that is really nice about working virtually, um, that it can fit with your schedule. Um, so a little basic about what I do. So I, for being the information uh, technology specialist, you know, I really create online tutorials. You know, we work a lot with our customers to give them information literacy modules, tutorials, videos, and really help them with um, the library's goals and needs for the instructional needs. Uh, I do a lot of professional development for myself by attending conferences, but also presenting, uh, publishing, things like that. Um, Credo has a really great corporate culture that really encourages professional development and working remotely. About half of our staff work remotely. The main office is in Boston, and um, everyone comes to Boston to the main office once a year in October for our offsite, which is one big company meeting. It's a lot of fun, um, and it's really nice. You know, working remotely, it can be lonely, but it, you do, when you work with the same people again and again, you do form um, the regular workplace attachments. So it's nice to see people in person. Um, and then the last thing we really focus on is really process improvement. So um, while Credo is a library vendor and, you know, it's still within the library realm, it is an alternative library career. It's not, you know, sitting behind a ref desk or, you know, doing cataloging or something like that. It's very different. So a lot of the corporate uh, processes and cultures really seep in. So uh, we focus a lot on process improvement also. So I just wanted to give a quick basic about what is instructional technology. Um, I had to put this picture of the librarian from Monster View on here because I was really offended and I hope everyone else was also. But um, basically, you know, it's not, you know, ed education changes so much so fast. So everyone's trying to keep up and everyone's moving their stuff online, whether it's classes. I and mean, obviously, SJSU knows that since uh, everything's online. But libraries are really trying to keep up also. So uh, we help and we create information literacy videos and tutorials. Um, to do that, we use a lot of tools at our, uh, at our fingertips. We use Adobe Suite, Captivate, Photoshop, After Effects, uh, HTML, JavaScript, jQuery, uh, PHP. Um, we have to be sure about accessibility also. So um, because we're going to state libraries and lots of other people that we have to make sure that they can all access our stuff. So you can use a lot, a lot of tools to uh, make your um, instructional technology thing. Um, so I'm kind of moving into a new position for an integration specialist. Um, the thing about working remotely for an alternative library position is that you, it's not like getting a tenure library position or a tenure track position where you're going to be in the same job for five years and uh, you work at it. So, you know, you have to, your corporations, they react to the market very quickly and it's a very agile position. So you have to be able to change, to learn new skills, to uh, react like the company does to the market. So one thing that we're doing is we just put out some courseware uh, for information literacy. Um, really just this last year. So I've really been taking a role in integrating that with learning management systems, uh, doing tech support for customers, and being that first line, you know, translating library speak into technical speak, working with the developers, um, translating that back to the customers. So it's uh, very much a, uh, 
a role that, you know, changes a lot when you're in an alternate library career. And I'm sure it does in regular libraries also. But more so when you're working remotely and um, for a corporation. So what do I do as an integration specialist? Um, well, we work with the VLE, which is the virtual learning environment, um, as well as learning management system maintenance and testing. So Blackboard, D2L, um, Sakai, Canvas, there's a whole list of learning management systems that we work with. And I get to make tutorials on how to embed things for the faculty, um, host faculty webinars on how to put things into their learning management system and things like that. So it's a really great skill to have. Um, I'm also the first line technical support for customers. So they call in and we have a nice uh, support help desk system. So um, we get tickets and emails come in straight to us and we can answer the emails. Um, we're working on getting a chat widget, which would be fun. Um, and also, you know, we translate the librarian speak into the techno speak. So, um, often what librarians say does not always correlate to what developers need to hear. Um, they're not always on the same slide. And also it works backwards for customer service because developers do not always have the best bedside manner. Um, so, you know, they kind of need someone to interpret between the two. So uh, that's really nice to do, you know, really focus on customer service and um, being a go-between and a liaison between the development as well as the customers. And then, like I mentioned, um, I do some faculty librarian training. So I can train um, whole rooms of faculty as well as one-on-one -on -one trainings for librarians on how to input our courseware into their learning management system or how best to use it in a flipped classroom, um, depending on whatever their needs are. So I just wanted to give some tips for telecommuting. Um, I know Deanne really covered a lot of the pros and the cons, so I'm not going to go over all of them again, but I second everything that she said. But, um, you know, one thing that is really important is that you have to be flexible. Like, like I mentioned, it's not a, you know, you're in a job and you're going to stay there and you're going to always do the same thing. Um, the market changes, so your job has to change to match the market. And you have to be flexible. Uh, you, you know, you have to continue your, your professional development. I like to attend library conferences because in my job, I don't actually work with very many librarians. Um, it's very much a corporate thing. So it's nice to go to the library conferences to kind of like go back to my roots and remember what I am and, uh, you know, what's going on in the library sphere. So you don't lose any of your skills and you can learn new things and bring them back to the corporate world where other people don't have those skills or they haven't been to this conference. So um, it's really good to keep up on your professional development. Um, when you're telecommuting, it's also important to keep your work-life balance in balance. Um, it's easy to say, oh, I'll just do that over the weekend or I'll bring my computer on vacation with me and, you know, work when I'm on the beach or something. But that can, can lead to burnout really fast and it's really not healthy at all. So, you know, you have to be able to say it's five o'clock, I'm turning off Skype, I'm turning off my whatever form of technology you use to communicate with your team. You know, I'm offline, I'm turning off, I'm out of the office for the day. Um, it's really important to keep that work-life balance uh, in perspective. Um, otherwise, working remotely, it's really, really easy to just let your job become your life and have there be no line and you end up just working all the time every day. So um, the, la the last couple things I want to mention, you know, it's not necessarily a con, uh, prepare for isolation because I am a uh, very much an introvert. I'm one of those people who would like to say, just stick me in a basement and let me do my job. Don't talk to me. <laughs> so um, telecommuting is really nice because there are some days that go by where I actually don't talk to anybody. Um, I just do my job. So, um, so for some people like me, that's really fantastic and it fits really well. For other people, and um, we've had people leave who haven't been able to handle it. You know, they need to interact with other people. They need to see people face to face. So, you know, if you're thinking about a job in a virtual job or an internship, you know, you have to be prepared for it's going to be isolated. You know, it's not going to be like working next to someone in a cubicle. Um, and because of that, you need to be communicate, you need to communicate very clearly. 
um, you know, like Dan mentioned, it's really easy to misunderstand things when you're Skyping or instant messaging or emailing. Um, the tone never comes off quite correct or as you mean. So, uh, you know, it's really important to work on your communication skills and be very direct but at the same time professional. Uh, and with that, um, I'll hand it over to Jessica. She uh, also works with me at Credo. All right, thank you, Laura. So, um, hello everyone. <laughs> My name is Jessica Creighton. And just a brief personal note about myself to begin. I currently live in Texas with my husband, our three and one year old daughters, as well as our family dog. And I enjoy reading, running, and having tea parties with my daughters and their many, many dolls. So, um, as Laura said, I also work for Credo Reference. I'm also an instructional technology specialist alongside Laura. And I know Laura provided um, some information about what we do, so I just wanted to go into um, my background about how I came to this position. So if you'll all bear with me, I wanted to um, conduct a quick little poll. Um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you can see my pointer on the screen, use the drop down. Um, it starts with an A, and then you'll see A, B, and C. Um, and then the question, I'll have you all answer. Prior to entering SGSU's program, how would you rate your experience in the librarian field? Again, this is prior to entering the program. So select A if you believe you had a good foundation, if you had spent more than um, three years in the profession, as a professional in the field. Um, B if maybe you had put your toe in the field, we'll say less than three years. Or C if you had no experience in the, in the librarian field prior to entering the program. It looks like we're getting a lot of responses already. I'll go ahead and publish the responses so everyone can see. Okay, it looks like a good majority, 40% had no experience in the field. And I'm happy to say that was me as well. <laughs> I was in exactly the same boat. Um, prior to entering SJSU, SJSU's program, I worked as an administrative assistant at an insurance company and was simply attempting to follow my interests. Um, in fact, the reason I decided to apply for the program was a bit unorthodox. Um, while I was working at the insurance company, I knew I was unhappy in the field, but I wasn't sure what path I wanted to take. So I began perusing job descriptions on Monster. I know that's a bit weird, but I browsed job descriptions on Monster. <laughs> um, I made a list of the job descriptions that sounded interesting to me. Um, basically the ones that I wanted to pursue as ultimately a career. And then I further divided that list into the necessary skills and education required for each of those jobs. And an overwhelming amount requested a master's in library and information science. So um, I applied to SJSU's program. And then once I began the program, I decided I would continue the same line of thinking. I carefully studied the course descriptions listed on SJSU's website, um, along with the syllabi that were archived from previous semesters. And then I highlighted those courses that I believe to be aligned with my interests. Um, and then I, I took those courses and I further cross-referenced this list with the school's list of career pathways, and I have the URL right here on the screen. Um, and just taking a look at these, these pathways and um, kind of the what courses aligned um, with what jobs helped me give a bit of a, a bit of direction for myself. So I went ahead and included on the screen a list of the top courses that ended up being on my um, final list of courses that I wanted to make sure that I completed um, during my time at SJSU. And these courses ultimately led me to the Emerging Technologies Pathway. And as you begin to peruse the pathways on the website yourself, um, just keep in mind that the pathways are meant to be used more as jumping off points. You'll find that sometimes the pathways may overlap and sometimes they may include courses in their recommendations that may not be pertinent to your ultimate dream career. Um, I, I believe the best thing that you can do to help you find the career that you would be most happy in is to choose your courses based on your specific interests.
And then once I reached the midway point in SJS Youth Program, I began to look at internships that also aligned with my interest. Um, since I had already outlined the courses that aligned with my interests, I was able to take the skills I learned or would learn in those specific courses and then use those skills to locate the internships that I wanted to pursue. So um, basically I had my interests, which I used to determine the courses I wanted to take, then I took the skills I obtained from those courses and used those to look for internships that required those skills. So I, ho I hope everyone followed my line of thinking there. <laughs> and basically it just made sure that everything led back to being based on my personal interests. And CRUDA Reference was one of many internships I had applied to that semester. And in my resume, I made sure to highlight the skills that I had learned thus far in the program, and even those I planned to learn in the program. I felt it was important to illustrate to hopefully my future employer that I had continued plans for learning and growth. Also in my application, I drafted a cover letter that was different than the standard format and also I felt a bit more straightforward. Instead of writing a paragraph filled cover letter, I created more of a table like the one on the screen. The first column was numbered. The second column listed the specific skills that they were looking for in applicants. And then the third column demonstrated specifically and concisely how I met or had plans to meet in upcoming courses the skills that they were, they were requiring from applicants. And also it helped to even throw in um, maybe some of their desired skills that I met, <laughs> just to give me a little bit more of a boost. But I felt in this way I not only stood out from the pack of resumes I'm sure they had received, but I made the recruiter's job that much easier. I made the connections for them between what they were looking for and what I could provide, as well as illustrating the level of commitment I would ultimately bring to the position simply by drafting a cover letter that was unique to their application and not using the same generic couple of paragraphs that I could have used for any other application. I wrote it specifically for them. And one thing I noticed as I was applying to these positions, employers are very excited when you, the applicant, seek to acquire skills on your own. So these skills would be in addition to those you acquire within the structured setting of the classroom, within SGSU. For example, um, programs such as Jing, QuickTime, Prezi, even LinkedIn and Google Drive, employers like to hear that you were able to explore and even master such programs on your own and in your own time, especially when you're pursuing a virtual career. You have to remember that you're on your own for a good, a good part of the day, like Laura said. So make sure to demonstrate you're capable of learning and even troubleshooting on your own and that you would thrive in that virtual setting. Finally, I wanted to talk a bit about transitioning my internship into a full-time position. Again, this involves backing up the claims that I made in my resume, cover letter, and interview, that I have the skills they're looking for and that I would thrive in that virtual setting. So you have to prove in, the, in those um, instances, the resume, the cover letter, and the interview, that you're able to master programs on your own, like, you, like Laura said, without your employer sitting next to you in the next cubicle, because when you're in that virtual setting, your employer doesn't see the behind the scenes. They don't know if you're sitting in your pajamas. They don't know if you're taking notes when they're talking. They don't know if you're locked in a basement. <laughs> Basically, the proof is in the pudding, or in other words, the proof is in your work and the quality you put forth. And then for further reading, I also included the link um, to a blog post that I wrote um, over two years ago. It was during um, my internship. I think I was halfway through my internship when I wrote this. And it's listed on I the iSchool's virtual internship blog. It's titled, How to Survive Your Virtual Internship. And it just contains some helpful tips that I used throughout my internship. I actually use um, quite a few of these so still in my full-time position. So thank you everyone for um, listening and taking part in my brief poll. I also provided some contact information on the screen as well as the two links that are listed on the previous slides. And please feel free to contact me with any questions you might have or send me a request to connect on LinkedIn. Okay, I just want to thank everybody. This was fantastic. I, I'm so impressed with how you all of you thought about where you were going to go and what classes you'd take and the work you would do and what you shared. 
Um, we have 15 minutes, and I'm going to open this up to questions. Yeah, I actually have a question for the, I'm, I'm so sorry, I, I should remember the name, uh, for the first presenter. Uh, she mentioned cataloging, and I was wondering what, how would she um, evaluate more um, in terms of classes to take, cataloging or uh, metadata? I guess it kind of depends on uh, what area you're really wanting to go into in terms of, um, you know, whether you want to do traditional cataloging. As far as MightyNet goes, um, they really want us to have cataloging, so that was 248. I didn't actually take metadata, so I can't really speak too much to that class. I've, I've heard good things about it, though. Um, the, the cataloging class, the 248 that I took, was really more of, um, you know, how to create the MARC data, um, and RDA was kind of coming out then. That's the new uh, standard for cataloging. So one or the other, I'm not really sure. I think it kind of depends on what um, what area of librarianship you want to go into. If you want to go into strictly cataloging and technical services, I would say cataloging is probably going to be your best bet. Um, but if you have time, you know, maybe take both. Thank you. Thank you. Good idea. Well, while we're waiting for other people, I'm going to bring up a question that may be on others' minds and nobody's mentioned, and that's how salary and pay, do you feel that it's comparable to other jobs? Are you paid by the piece? Are you paid by the hour? I mean, how does it work? I'm curious. And anybody, any one of you can answer that, please feel free. Well, I know that for uh, Credo Reference, at least, um, we are salaried employees as opposed to contractors. So we have the full regular salary um, as well as, like, benefits and 401ks and uh, stock options and everything. So um, it's very different from being a contractor. The interns are considered contractors. Um, so we have uh, probably about maybe, like, eight to ten interns. Um, and they are contractors, but once you become an employee, you're a regular salaried employee for us. Yeah, and as far as MightyNet goes, um, since we are contracted, most of the ICCs that we work with um, do have other jobs, whether it's part-time or um, some of us do work full-time jobs. We are paid um, by each record that we complete. So each record on a normal, you know, if you're sitting down and you're just going to town on that record, I can usually get them done in about a half an hour. So I can usually do about two per hour. Um, I forget what the interns make. Um, I know it's slightly lower than what we make um, as ICCs, but we make $5 per record. So, I mean, it's really not something, I mean, unless you're doing it, uh, non-stop th that, you know, would really be a full-time career per se, but um, I was actually in between jobs um, for about a month earlier in uh, last year, and it was really nice to, you know, to still be working for MightyNet to have um, some, you know, some extra income. And, and also, um, I know other people who do work by the item. And the more they do it, the better and faster they get at it. So at some point, it begins to be a better rate of pay. But I think that depends on how fast you are and how accurate you are. Um, anybody else questions? Go for it. So Heather asked, um, are there other classes or outside skills that you recommend for current students? And um, I'm going to let any one of you respond to that, please. Uh, one thing that I would recommend um, coming from being a secretary with uh, Swiss Connect while I was um, going through the SJSU program, there's uh, the 23 things that uh, Swiss Connect um, offers. It's a small program that I think you can go through. I'll, I'll find the link for everyone, but um, I, I definitely recommend going through the, the 23 things we have listed. They're very helpful. I agree with that. And I also wanted to say um, 
being coming from the uh, technology part that, you know, 246 and really the technology classes, even if it's the basic, um, you know, web technologies. Um, I went all the way into the PHP ones, but um, it's important because it's so, such a marketable skill these days and really any kind of industry that you go into. So I think it's a valuable skill um, that can give you a broader reach in your job search, um, even beyond the library border. And then um, I see the next question um, about being the first line of service. So yes, we actually do talk to the customers. Um, so it's a mix of everything. So um, I have librarians who practically have me on speed dial. Um, and then I have some who email me like 10 times a day and then some that we just email back and forth. So it's really a mix. Go for it again, Ariana. Yeah, I actually wanted to ask uh, Laura, you say that you are an instructional, um, instructional technology. When, when you took those classes, like when you were a peer mentoring in uh, 298, were you thinking of maybe teaching or something and you just fell into this job or what, what were you thinking of doing with the, before you you had this job, I don't know if it makes sense. For me, um, I was actually really interested in being a web, like a web programmer, so I had already done a whole lot of technology things prior to even coming into the uh, SWIFT program. So I graduated in 2012, um, and so as soon as I came in, you know, I already had the basic foundational skills, and I knew that. I could build on them and be more marketable. Um, and I already had a broad corporate background, so it was really easy to go straight into the corporate uh, realm for me. Kathy asked a really good question. Do any of you know of companies hiring graduates who haven't been interns with them? So would your companies hire people who haven't been interns, and do you know of other companies? I know with a credo reference that we definitely do hire uh, outside of interns. Um, being an intern is, however, a nice way to get an inside check. Um, I think this, I don't know what the statistic is offhand, but I think like probably like 30% of jobs don't even get posted because they're filled from within. So, um, you know, it's always a good way to get your feet wet to make sure it's the right fit because even if it's the right fit for you, there might be personality conflicts and things like that. So uh, being an intern first is a really nice way to gently ease into it, but we definitely hire uh, outside of interns a lot. Yeah, and as for MyNet, um, I'm actually not positive how they hire ICCs from outside of the internship program. Um, all of the ones that I currently work with have been interns in the past. Um, so like Laura just said, you know, it's a really great way to kind of see if it's for you, um, you know, and get a feel for what the work would be. Um, but if, I mean, of course, there's always, um, you know, virtual jobs and stuff that you can find that, um, that don't have internships beforehand or that, you know, that you don't have to have done an internship with. I typed a question for one of our participants, Lisa McDonald, because she said in the chat that she was working part-time remotely and really liked it. So I don't know, Lisa, if you're still in the room. You are. Maybe you can respond, and I think Lisa's trying to chat and respond to us. But we'll take more questions. We have a few more. So Lisa doesn't work in the library field, but she does work remotely and she enjoys it. Okay. I know there are remote jobs. In fact, um, think about all of your library school instructors. These are remote jobs. We teach remotely. <laughs> That's what I think. Thought. <laughs> okay, I'm going to leave it for other questions. Anybody? I just want to say something from my background, which is that in 
my long career in a variety of jobs, a lot of them in education and in librarianship, often a full-time job that was a physical job would turn into a job with telecommuting possibilities, with more remote possibilities, and as people got to know you and what you could do and saw how you could communicate from a distance and get your work done, more and more were you, was I allowed or enabled to work remotely. So you can also think about that kind of mix because as students in our school, you have so many skills that you have developed simply by going through the program and being successful. You handle technology, you handle change, how many different learning management systems have you coped with. All this stuff is just incredibly competitive, competitive advantages. So when you go looking for work, think about the competitive advantage of having been successful in an online program. I'm going to um, give the mic back to any one of our speakers who wants to close with any words, and then I'll say goodnight. I would just like to say thank you to everyone uh, who, who came tonight. Um, and for bearing with me trying to present two uh, presentations. And uh, just another kind of plug for MightyNet, um, they're a great company to work for. It's a wonderful internship and it's paid internship, which is, you know, always a plus. Um, and, uh, you know, they're real, real good about um, hiring after the internship. So um, come join us. We love, uh, we love San Jose State students. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you, Deanne. You did great. <laughs> and um, absolutely, if there's anyone who has any follow-up questions, something that you um, think of later, feel free to um, email any one of us or find us on LinkedIn. Thank you. Well, I'm going to say thank you to everybody who came and to all our wonderful presenters. So we'll be on for a few more minutes and then we'll hang up. But thank you all for being here. And thank you, Pam.